trying to say. But others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul is preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. I love when people ask that question. I've never heard that before. What are you talking about? I get that a lot of times. Sometimes it's just my craziness. But other times, it's something really cool I've got. Here, here. <laughs> now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. A little jab at the Athenians, huh? But Paul stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. <coughs> Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the entire earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, which seems to be Paul's favorite word, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. This is a side note. If you noticed all the detail, some of the historical and some of the other things that are in there, a reminder that the book of Acts was actually written by Luke. And when you see the writings of Luke and then uh, the Gospel of Luke, and then you see the, uh, the book of Acts, you'll notice a lot of similarities in the literary style as well. But anyway, so Paul talked a lot about his faith, and he talked about his Jesus. You see, because Paul knew who his God was. Amen. And what Paul, what Paul did is something that you and I can do if we know God the way he did. But what did Paul know about God that, I hate to say we don't know, but sometimes we try to ignore, or maybe we conveniently forget. But what did Paul know about God that we sometimes don't know? So I love to use illustrations and tell stories. So here's an interesting one. There's a farmer, and he decided that he knew as much as any doctor. So he opened a doctor's office in town. He charged $500 a visit, but he promised that if he couldn't cure you, he'd give you a thousand dollars. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Everybody was quite amused by it, except the town's doctor, who <laughs> imagined him having an issue with this, right? He was very offended, and he decided to expose the farmer as a fraud. So he went to the farmer's office and he said, Doc, I seem to have lost my ability to taste. Can you cure me? 
The farmer called out, nurse, give him three drops from that blue bottle. She administered the drops and the real doctor began to choke. That's gasoline! <laughs> the farmer smiled and said, congratulations, your taste has been restored. Only $500. <laughs> got the doctor even more fired up because now not only was he humiliated, he got 500 bucks. He paid up and he stomped out of the office. But he came back and a couple of days later he said, doctor, I think I've lost my short-term memory. Can you cure me? I said, sure, nurse, give him three drops from that little blue bottle. No, that's gasoline, cried the doctor. Congratulations! You're not cured. <laughs> got out his checkbook and paid up again. <laughs> but a week later, he just couldn't let it go. He thought of one more thing that might stop this presumptuous farmer. So he walked into the office, and he's doing it upright this time. He had a white cane, and he's staring off into space. He says, Doctor, I think I may be going blind. Can you restore my sight? Farmer looked at him and he looked at the floor and suddenly said, no, I'm afraid I can't do that. I guess I'll have to pay you the thousand dollars. Farmer's grinning, or the doctor's grinning. Hold out your hand so I can pay you. The doctor smiled. Yeah, got it. The farmer put a $50 bill in it. The doctor looks down and says, hey, that's only a 50. And the farmer smiled. Congratulations, your eyesight's been restored. That would be $500. Of course, it's a joke, right? But notice that the farmer always knew just what to say to the doctor. And in our text today, Paul seems to have that exact same talent. He knows just how to reach these Athenians, how to reach these Jews, how to reach these Greeks. <clears throat> and he always seemed to know what to say to his audience. And here he is in Athens, one of the most advanced cities of the age. It was a center of learning. It had one of the greatest universities in the ancient world, and it was a center of philosophy, literature, science, art. And, and some of the greatest philosophers and thinkers lived there. Euripides, Plato, Socrates. And it was here in Athens that the idea of democracy actually started, actually took root. So now here's Paul, and he's standing in front of a very highly educated audience. And he's challenged to convince them about Jesus. And he says just the right things. That's great, right? Because a lot of us aren't generally like that. I know I'm not generally like that. I can come up with some clever stuff now and again, but usually I need a day or two to think of. Um, <laughs> that saying something profound, if you put me on the spot, eh, maybe not so much. I, I can argue I'm real good at that. I can trade shots with anyone, but uh, actually doing something of importance or making a real difference in their lives, yeah, I want, I want a little time to prepare, right? And I'm convinced that most people are just like me about that. And, and that's why a lot of Christians, that's why they don't like to talk to people about Jesus. They don't like to talk about their faith, and they're afraid you're going to mess it up somehow. I don't feel I know my Bible well enough to get into a discussion. What if they ask me questions that I don't know the answers to? Or, you know, these other things. And, and I'm going to tell you today, stop worrying about that so much. If you're not prepared to get into a theological, doctrinal discussion with people, then please don't. Amen. Those are the most boring, dumb talks I've ever had to do with people, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Tell them what how Jesus has made a difference in your life. Because that's what they really need to know. I'm looking at, at this passage of Scripture in Acts 17. And when you look at it, you realize what Paul did was really simple. And it would be fairly easy for you and for me to put what Paul did into practice in our own lives, in a conversation with other people. We just paid attention and relaxed with it. <laughs> First, I want you to notice this. Paul spoke to the crowd because he was provoked. And sometimes we need that. We were talking earlier about walking into an ambush. You know? Sometimes we need to get a little fired up. We need to get, get riled up a little bit. Amen. Yeah. Okay. 
While Paul was at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him because the city was filled with idols. And that's what got Paul to talking. He was provoked. He was agitated. It bothered him to see this city so filled with idols. Because think of it. This is Athens, Greece. This is a cool place. I don't think there's ever been a cooler place going than Athens. Especially the ancient world. Because this is where, this was the cradle of civilization, if you want to call it that. And everything was there. All, so many incredible thoughts came out of there. So much discussion, so much reading, so much investigation. Just an awesome place. And the architecture, and the art. It, it, I, and to, for him to look upon all that, and then say, all of these things, and these stone idols are getting the glory for it? Yeah, that upset him. One of the greatest centers of learning in the ancient world, and these folks can't make up their minds what to do with God. One scholar noted that it was easier to find an idol in Athens than it was to find a man. It's estimated that there were over 30,000 idols that were worshipped in Athens. Oh my. And as Paul mentioned in our text, in case they missed one, they have a god to an unknown god. They have an idol to an unknown god. Sure they got them all. Just in case. Just in case we missed one, this will be it. This will be the generic idol for anyone we may have missed. I I'm sorry, but if you're a god and you can't be noticed, you're doing something wrong. Then you don't belong in being a god. Paul's provoked, and it bugs him to no end to see that these people are worshiping idols made out of wood and stone, and they're being so foolish about God. So why was Paul so provoked? Was he provoked like, like how I get when I go to Walmart? And, I don't know, I can get I can get out a lot of things here. It might get me fired. We're gonna go there. Uh, just say like one of the things I hate is when somebody leaves their shopping cart in the lot. Drives me crazy, right? I, I carry zip ties in my truck and I swear I'm gonna zip tie to their car sometime. Uh, I haven't done it yet because there's cameras. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean does that provoke you too? Do you say something under your breath when you see that? I, I do sometimes. I say it out loud. But I'm provoked and so I speak. And I think, how can they be so lazy? How can they be so disrespectful? And I don't think kind thoughts about those people. So was Paul provoked like that? I, I don't think so. It's not, not that kind of provoked. When I see those carts at Walmart, I don't think kind thoughts about those people. But Paul thought kind, loving thoughts about the people of Athens. He didn't say mean things to them that day. You see, he was provoked because he was heartbroken that they were so lost. That they could be so smart and so skilled and so talented and yet be so blind. You can be surrounded by such an incredible array of things and you're giving the credit to some hunk of rock. He says to them in, in verse 22, he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. That's not an insult. It's not a put down. He complimented them. So why would he do that? He did it because he wanted them to know his God. He's not trying to put them in their place. He's trying to bring them into God's grace. Amen. Now, if you miss everything else in this sermon, don't miss this part. Because Paul said what he said because he knew who his God was. And these people were ignorant about God. They were going to hell because they couldn't see who God was. And the beauty of this was, Paul remembered when he was like that. Mm -hmm. He remembered when he had been ignorant about God, and he too was on his way to hell. Like all of us. And, and this is exactly what we need to remember. When we, when we see somebody who's doing something that makes us crazy, 
And more than likely, it offends you or it upsets you because you may have been that way once yourself. Amen. We get upset about people, non-Christians, when they don't think like Christians. What's wrong with us? Why do we expect that from the unsaved? Yep. They can't help it. That's, that's how they're going to act. That's how they're going to think. It's how they're going to behave. And you were just like that one time. Come on, man. All right? Yeah. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Just like all the rest of you but me. Oh wait, that's not what he says. Oh, 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 oh. He says, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. I preached 20 sermons from those two verses of scripture right there. Amen. But here's the beautiful part about that, right? You think about this. Paul said he was the worst of sinners. And he was a pretty bad man. And the beauty was the Christians who he put to death were cheering for him when he came into heaven. Did you ever think of it in those terms? Mm -hmm. The ones that he had put to death, they died wanting him to be saved. Perhaps the last prayer on, on their heavenly lips, or their earthly lips, was that, that God would save him. And that prayer was answered. Now these people in Athens, okay, let's get back to them. They had messed everything up. And they couldn't figure out who God was. <clears throat> so their response, since they couldn't figure out who God was, was to keep creating new ones. Eventually, you get them right. right? We keep creating one, finally one will hit. Right? <laughs> you know why WD-40 is named what it is? It did, right? The W and the D stand for water displacement. And the 40th means the 40th attempt. <laughs> They kept trying and trying until they got it right. Now, WD-39 probably works pretty well. But not as good as WD-40, because that fixes everything. <laughs> WD-40 and duct tape, you need no other tools. <laughs> Amen. Great. There you yeah. go, right? Come on now. <laughs> but these guys, they just kept trying to create new guns. I'll make, let's make a new one. We'll make another one. Oh, that one's not doing it. Let's just create another one. And their religious life that it became filled with uncertainty because they couldn't believe in anything because they just kept being failed. If you, and this is the <coughs> real thing. If you'd ask them if their gods loved them, they would say no. Because their gods offered them no love, no mercy, and no hope. Someone once noted that the Assyrians, Babylonians, Phoenicians, Egyptians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, they had their many gods. Gods of war, gods of industry, gods of agriculture, <laughs> gods of cities, gods of towns, and various others. But in all the galaxy of gods, there was never one called the god of hope, or the god of mercy, or the god of love. They didn't have gods who cared for them. They had gods who seemed to be appeased and bribed not to harm them. Augustine of Hippo, he had written, I have read from Plato and Cicero sayings that are very wise and beautiful, but I never read in either of them, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hmm. You see, that is the God that Paul knew and loved. Because Paul knew God cared for him, that God had shown mercy to him. You're all familiar with the story of the conversion of, of Paul, right? His name was Saul. And, and I, I love the story. In fact, it's the beginning of the book of Acts, or early in. And he's taken from his horse. And he's laying on the ground. And he's blinded except for this bright light that he can see. And he says, who are you, Lord? At that point, 
he knew he had messed up. Mm. Because this God who he said didn't exist had knocked him off his horse and was blinding him. While he's on his way to take the life of the followers of this same God. <clears throat> you ever have one of those moments in your life when you know you messed up real bad? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This was Paul's biggest, I really messed up. And he's expecting at this point to be cast into hell for eternity. In revenge for what he had done to the followers of this God. But instead, he received mercy. He received forgiveness. He received grace because he did not deserve that mercy and forgiveness. And that experience propelled him to go on an incredible missionary career. I mean, because of all, we have half our New Testament. Plus all the churches that were started and planted. I mean, you had the 11 disciples that were left, but none of them did all together did half as much as Paul got done. Because Paul experienced firsthand grace of God. Amen. So much that he had to share it with everybody. So here he is in Athens, and it's a great city, and it's filled with people who have never felt that kind of love, forgiveness, mercy, grace. And you can tell that they want it because they have so many gods that they're, that they're trying to worship. They're seeking for something. He can tell they're looking for it. I can picture Paul saying to himself, if somebody hadn't talked to me, I'd never known who God was. So Paul speaks to this crowd. The question is this, how do we talk to others about our faith? Because what Paul did in Athens is something you and I can do. Like I said earlier, what Paul did was not so hard. What did he do? First of all, he listened to that inner voice. He was provoked in his spirit, and he said, and he did something about it. Something inside him said, now. Now is the time for you to say something. God will set up a chance for you to share your faith with others. If you talk about him, if you let him, Paul was so provoked in his spirit, and he said something. What did Paul say? He started by getting their attention. Did you see this idol? It's an idol to an unknown God. It's been here all the time. It's known by everybody, but somehow it got lost in the shuffle. So Paul starts and uses this idol to an unknown God as a conversation starter. You can do that. Start a conversation by pointing out something obvious and use it to introduce God. One of the things I like to say in the morning as people come into work is, what a beautiful day the Lord has given us. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And it is a beautiful day, and people are comfortable talking about the weather. But you notice how I put it? That God gave us. Or so that God is really blessing us with this weather. Suddenly use God as part of your comments. And don't be too obvious. Don't do it as a challenge. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you a Christian? <laughs> that really doesn't reach people well, I'm just saying. <laughs> Not really. No. And if the folks you're talking to, if they're ready, they'll start talking to you about their faith or their lack of it. And you take it from there. Mm. One of the worst things that I think ever happened to me was earlier in my life, I had taken some classes on sales. I used to listen to those cassette tapes you saw how long ago it was by a guy named Brian Tracy. And one of my favorite ones that I think I wore the tapes out was The Art of Closing Sales. And the reason why I say that was so bad was because now a lot of times I would buy something but I realized the guy's trying to use one of those techniques on me and it, it angers me so I walk away. You know, they'll say things like, why don't you just take it home with you, and if you don't like it, you can just bring it back. Yeah. Well, that's called the pet shop clothes. I hate that. Yeah. And if anybody else, well, we have another person really interested in this. Yeah. Well, that's the takeaway clothes. No, I don't do that either. Yeah. Um, all of these things, and you, and you can spot them. But what I'm getting at is people will know when you're trying to sell them something, yeah. and will instantly step it up, instantly become difficult to read. In verse 30, Paul mentioned to the people at Athens, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent 
because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. What Paul's telling Athens, the people at Athens that day was, you guys need Jesus because judgment's coming. It's on its way and you're going to have to answer for this. And you're smart enough to see it. You're not going to be able to give an excuse. Look at all the things you've done. Look at the temples you've built. Look at the, all the scrolls all the, that you've written, the university, all of these things. You need to change your life. Repent means turn around and go back to God. Mm. And there will be times when the people around you, they're going to talk to you about how miserable their lives are. The easiest conversation at work is to listen to the people complaining about how bad their job is. <laughs> or they're having problems in their relationships, or problems in their marriage, or they feel empty, they feel worthless, they're bored with their lives. And all you have to say is it sounds like you might need to turn your life around. You may have to change something in your life. God can fix that for you. And then do something like, hey, by the way, you know, we have a church service Sunday at 1030. An Easter egg hunt. A soup luncheon. Why don't you go with me? I heard the story of a man being in the Bahamas. And he was a tourist. And a guy walked up to him and wanted to sell him drugs. And, and that does happen all the time. I remember walking through the, the straw market with Cassie. And I think we were offered drugs three or four times. Different people. And you can tell everyone how much you really enjoyed the Bahamas. And after this guy said no... And he got over the shock of that man's boldness. He began to wonder how Jesus would have responded if someone would have come up to him and tried to sell him drugs. So later that day, someone else came up to him trying to sell him drugs. And it occurred to him that this could be an opportunity to share Jesus. And after the guy told him that he had the good stuff, the man asked the drug dealer, what have you got? And the dealer said, cocaine. And the Christian responded, oh, that's all you have. I'm disappointed. I was hoping you'd have something better than that. Because I've got the real stuff. It's natural, pure, and very powerful. It makes me feel great all day and all night. And get this, it might be illegal in some countries, but not here. You can't even get arrested for having it. By this time, this drug dealer is very curious. He said, what is this incredible stuff? And the Christian replied, I'm talking about having Jesus in your heart. Amen. All right, all right. It's possible for people to do you get it inside of you. No drug in the world is as good as having Jesus in you. Amen. 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 And he said that the man stopped smiling and got this real serious look on his face and said, I want what you have. How do I get it? So you can say something like that. You can come up with something clever. You can tell a joke, you can... It all depends on the person. But you really need to form some type of a relationship with this person. Like I said before, don't let the people think that you're trying to sell them something. You can, if you tell them that Jesus can fix what's wrong in their life, they have to know that you believe that. You don't want to come off as faking it. Because they'll know you're putting them on. You need to believe it yourself. Know it. Believe it. When Paul spoke up in Athens, he spoke because he knew who his God was. Amen. Amen. He knew his God loved him and had shown mercy to him and had changed his life. Most of all, he knew that God had done all this for him and did not, he did not deserve it. When he was laying there on the ground on that road to Damascus and he can't see and he's blinded and he's hearing this voice from heaven from this God who he had claimed never existed, he knew the last thing in the world that he needed was to be helped by the followers of this God. That's the last thing he deserved. And he was shocked that he not, did not receive that damnation for it. Paul knew that his God loved him and had shown mercy to him 
and it changed his life. Paul knew who his God was. Do you? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that we do know who you are. Dear Lord, we, we ask that you would constantly remind us how far you have brought us of what we were before you found us. Because we didn't find you. Lord, you came searching and looking for us constantly. Lord, never let us forget how far we've come. And remind us so that we have an incredible passion to share that with other people. Lord, we pray that we will use the beautiful things that you have given us here on this earth to be able to share your love with other people. Everything out here that's beautiful points to you, God. And let us use that in such a way. Let us truly worship you by bringing someone else to a saving knowledge of your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.